Hi, and welcome to week two of Introduction to Linguistics. This week, we're going to look at phonetics, which is the study of sounds and gestures. These sounds and gestures, of course, are like the smallest component of human language, and we use them to build uh, units of meaning, which we then use to build words, and from those words, we build sentences and so forth. So they're really like the most elemental bit of human languages, which is why we're studying them first. There's two main branches of phonetics. There's articulatory phonetics, which is the study of how sound is produced by your mouth, and also the study of how gestures are produced um, by your hands when using sign languages, your hands and parts of your face, as we saw last week. There's articulatory phonetics, which is the study of production of sounds. And then there's acoustic or perceptual phonetics, which studies how those sounds are received by your ear or by your eyes, for example. So articulatory studies your lips, your tongue as you produce the sounds, and then acoustic studies how you perceive them. I want to talk about acoustic phonetics very briefly so that you can see a few of the parts of how sound is produced. So the very first part of the production of a sound is that your lung uh, pushes air through your throat and through your vocal cords, which are two flaps of flesh that are inside of your throat. And I want to show you what they look like when they are moving, when you are talking. Uh, uh, Here is a look at some oh, sorry. normal young female vocal... It looks very slow, but it's actually because the camera was slow. Those vocal cords were vibrating at least 200 times per second. So the vocal cords um, create a frequency, because they vibrate at a certain frequency, for the air coming out of your throat. And then the air enters your mouth, and your mouth acts like a cave. Have you ever been in a cave and you hear, you shout and you hear an echo, 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 and so forth? Um, your, your mouth changes the frequency of the air rushing out of your throat. And the geometry of your mouth changes depending on the sound you're producing. So your tongue is going to be in a certain position, your lips are going to be in a certain position. That's going to alter the frequencies that are coming out of your mouth. And is going to create a combination of frequencies, just like when you play a guitar or a violin. That air signal is going to travel out and then hit someone's ears. We can decompose that signal into its constituent frequencies. This is com something called a spectrogram. And as you can see, every human sound has a slightly distinct imprint in its frequencies. So our lips, our tongue, and every part of our mouth changes the shape of the sound. And that's how we produce our human sounds. And by the way, the study of the frequencies is acoustic phonetics. This week, we're going to focus on articulatory phonetics, which is, again, the study of how all of your mouth is moving to produce these sounds. And it is moving a lot. I want to show you with a magnetic resonance image exactly what it looks like when someone is singing. <laughs> Wow, that tongue is uh, touching the roof of her mouth. So as you can see, a lot of things were moving. Lips, tongue, this part in the back of the throat called the velum. Uh, that's how you produce um, nasal sounds. And yes, a lot of things are happening when you speak. And we're going to be looking at them one at a time. How are we going to study this? Maybe your first impulse would be to say, well, let's just look at the writing. And from there, we'll uh, get the sounds. And that's how we'll study what sounds are like. Uh, just from looking at the way a language is written. Because surely the writing must be capturing the sounds. 
This is not true. Spelling is all lies. Spelling um, is created through historical processes that usually favor older forms or we'll go into a lot of detail about this on week eight. But spelling is formed over time and sometimes pronunciation changes, word changes and spelling just doesn't uh, keep up. And we get a language like English where spelling does not match pronunciation at all. Uh, Bernard Shaw had this spelling for fish, where GH is the GH in tough, F, O is the O in women, F, and TI is the TI in nation or motion. So, fish. <laughs> this is a way in which you could write the word fish in English. And even though it's a little bit of a joke, it makes almost as much sense as the word, as the series of glyphs that we actually use. English has a very opaque writing system in that the, the relationship between the way it's written and the way it sounds is not very clear. In English, there are many words that are written differently but sound the same, such as bite, 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 eight, eight, here, here, and so forth. So these are different letters but with the same sounds. And we also get the opposite, where we have the same letters, but different sounds. Read and read, wind and wind, subject and subject, polish and polish, for example. So writing is not a reliable way to look at the sounds of a language. And this is true for all human languages. English is very opaque, but there are languages that are more transparent in their orthography, like Spanish. Even for those languages, writing does not correspond to sound. Spanish, for example, has a very transparent orthography where there's a good correlation between the, the letters and the sounds. But even then, there's a lot of things that are uh, in the writing that do not reflect what this language actually sounds like. For example, in the word arena, flower, the H is silent. It was, it's just there because of the historical processes that rendered it silent. It used to sound like an F. It was farina before and now it's silent. Um, this R here has three different sounds. Jana, pero, dash. And yes, that's my Costa Rican dialect, by the way. You'll hear a lot more about it in this uh, during this quarter. Jana, pero, dash. Same letter, three different pronunciations. So because writing is not a reliable way to look at the sounds of a language, we're going to be using something called the International Phonetic Alphabet. It was invented and it's continuously revised, as you can see, to be able to transcribe the sounds of every spoken human language. It's a lot of glyphs, but we'll explore them, you know, one at a time, we'll go slowly. And with this system, you can transcribe any spoken language. I think it's a beautiful table. In summary, there are two main branches of phonetics. Articulatory phonetics studies how sound is produced by your mouth. Oh, and there's something that I forgot to mention. We love the International Phonetic Alphabet, or IPA, so much because it has to do with articulation. What sounds are produced by your lips, bilabial, by your teeth, dental, by your uvula, the uvula on the back of your throat, ka, ra, and so forth. So international, the International Phonetic Alphabet is a good tool to describe articulatory phonetics, which is how sounds are produced by your mouth. And we will study later in the week how gestures are produced by hands. There's another branch, which is acoustic phonetics or perceptual phonetics, which is how sounds and gestures are perceived by your ear or your eyes. Spelling is not a good guide to sounds, so that's why we will be using the International Phonetic Alphabet or IPA. In the next video, we will look at, uh, start looking at the IPA.